Welcome to numerical methods. Yeah, so now that we know how to calculate numerically the partial derivative yeah, of a function, I have a small excursus where we can actually use this to infer something from a model without knowing much about the model. We can infer the density of the underlying, yeah, For if it is a model for a stock, yeah, I mean for the density of the stock, the probability density of the stock that is generated or assumed by this model. This is really an important little lemma, yeah, often mentioned under the name Breden and Litzenberger, and uh, it's useful to investigate uh, properties of the model or also check accuracy or absence of arbitrage of the model. And here is this little lemma. So probability density of the underlying of a European call option. So the remarkable thing here is that I assume that I have some model that generates this random variable s at t1. And I will now value a European option on this random variable. So this could be a stock. It could also be an interest rate model. Then it is a cap. Yeah, For example, if it is a forward rate, it is a caplet, yeah, an option on the forward rate. Uh, here it looks like it is a stock because I write S. Yeah, In that case, it is a call option on the stock, but it could be anything. And I assume that this S is generated by a model And this model is otherwise unknown. Okay, because all I can observe is the evaluation of this payoff. Yeah. So I have here the payment of a European option. So this is with strike K and say payment date T2 and fixing date T1. Okay, so here in this example, the payment date yeah, and the fixing date, yeah, they can be uh, different for an interest rate option. This is often the case. Yeah, you fix the interest rate at the beginning of the period and you then pay the amount at the end of the period. For a stock, yeah, the option usually fixes the stock value and then immediately pays out the corresponding payment. Um, so in that case, T1 is equal to T2. Yeah? So that actually doesn't, doesn't matter. The times are not so important here. So I have a payout function, yeah, um, and this payout function depends here on a strike value. K. So we pay maximum of S minus K and zero. So this is the payment of a European option. And I do not know the model that is used to create S. All I can observe is the evaluation of this payment. Yeah. So I have some machine that calculates the value of this European option using risk neutral valuation. That means the value of this financial derivative is given by choose an equivalent martingale measure associated with your numerea, take the payout divided by the numerea at payment date, take the expectation under the equivalent martingale measure, multiply with the numerea at evaluation date. So that's here the formula that calculates the value. So I have the value of my financial derivative in T0. So T0 is now my evaluation time. Four different strikes, yeah, for different strikes K. I can observe this value for different strikes K. I can just ask my machine value an European option with strike K1 equals 100, value a European option with strike 
k1 equals uh, 102 and so on. And now the claim is that if you calculate the the second derivative of this valuation function with respect to the strike, and you then divide by the numeraire, then this gives you the probability density of S of T1. Uh, so I can infer the probability density of the quantity that is generated here by my model without actually knowing which model it is by just differentiating the European call option prices twice with respect to the strike. So we get out the risk neutral probability density phi s. Yeah? So risk neutral because it is the probability density of the stock at the fixing time under my equivalent martingale measure. So the numeraire n is here chosen such that it is equal to one at the payment time, for example, for Black Scholes or for an equity model, yeah, where the numeraire is just a deterministic function. So for Black Scholes or also for Heston model, so for all these equity models, this just means that you choose your numeraire instead of an e to the rt, yeah, you just norm it to be an e to the t minus t2. Yeah? You could say an e to the minus t2 minus t. So a nice thing of this lemma is that now if a model is given as a black box, yeah, through some valuation formula, but the model allows you to value arbitrary European options. Yeah, you can perform valuation. Yeah, then you can use this lemma to infer the internal, so the model generated probability distribution of the stock. Yeah, you can get something out of the model. So prove is very easy. We have access to the valuation. So this means I have access to a machine that calculates here the expectation of the payoff function divided by my numeraire. Yeah? So my numeraire was chosen to be equal to one. So this guy is equal to one. So I have actually access to a function that calculates the expectation of here my payoff. So the payoff is maximum of S minus K and zero. Yeah? Uh, if you have now a density, this means that you have access to a machine that calculates the integral so my my expectation is an integral of the payoff multiplied with the density integrated over ds. Okay, and now the claim is if you differentiate this with respect to k twice, you get out the density. So the payoff function as a function of the stock value is maximum of s minus k and zero is this. So now if you differentiate here this maximum function with respect to k, this is like minus differentiate here this function with respect to s. Just look, look at this guy here. So if you differentiate this guy here with respect to s, actually you get an indicator function. So I get zero here and one here. Okay, so if you differentiate now with respect to k, first derivative, you actually can replace this guy below here with an indicator function. But then if you have an indicator function, this means that you have the integral over the density 
from k to plus infinity. So now you differentiate with respect to the lower bound again, with respect to the k again. This means you just have the density evaluated at k. So here are the two steps. Yeah, First, we differentiate with respect to k, and the payoff function is replaced by an indicator function yeah, with a minus. But then I can take this indicator function and just replace here the lower bound. So I integrate from k to minus um, infinity. So differentiating now again with k gives me minus the value that is under the integral evaluated at the lower bound. Yeah? So that's just the density here, of course, and there is in front the numeraire because the numeraire was here in front of our uh, valuation, valuation formula. So you divide by the numeraire and we are done. Yeah? So the density is the second derivative of the valuation divided by the numeraire. So this trick also allows you to check if a model uh, generates uh, arbitrage. Let's play a little bit with this uh, thing in a computer. I have a nice little experiment. It is called underlying density experiment. And since we calculate now the second derivative with finite differences, yeah, uh, it's also here in my package on finite difference. So that's now a nice application of uh, calculating the partial derivative yeah, using finite differences. So all our models are now black boxes. I can use now many different models. Yeah? We have already Monte Carlo implementations of the black schultz model, um, the Bachelier model, the Heston model, and so on. Yeah? You have many different models. So let's have a look at this experiment. It's here, underlying density experiment. So, and what are we doing? Okay, there is a function that is called plot density for model, and we will pass different models here. Yeah? So this is our black schultz model for different parameters. This is our Bachelier model yeah, for similar parameters. So here we uh, specify the parameters. So actually, since the initial value of the stock is one, uh, I could use the same volatility parameter for both models. Otherwise, you have to be a little bit careful, yeah, because here the diffusion coefficient in the Black Scholes model is sigma times s, and here the diffusion coefficient for the Bachelier model is just sigma. Yeah? So it's here sigma times s dw, and here sigma dw, yeah? so you see there is a factor of s involved, but s is actually on the same scale on one. Yeah? So these two models are similar, except that this is log normal and this is normal. And then I have some additional parameters here for the Heston model, yeah? um, and I also pass the Heston model to this uh, function. Maybe I comment the stuff here below out, yeah, and we will just look at these three model yeah, in the first um, experiment. So let's have a look at this function, plot density for model. Yeah? So this function is here below. It just creates here the plot, and it calls the function density of the model, which is a double unary operator. So a double unary operator is just a function that maps a floating point double to a floating point double. So this should be the density. So this is actually maps S, the value of the underlying stock, to the probability density value. So this should be the function phi of S. And I'm now calculating this function phi of S for any given model specification. So here you also see, linked to my session on implementation, how nice and generic now the code is. Yeah? I can create this plot now for any model without actually knowing what is the model. 
because this is the model specification and I will use now a Brownian motion, create a Brownian motion with um, a time discretization, which is here. From that Brownian motion and the model that is provided, create the Euler scheme, uh, wrap the Euler scheme in this class that allows me to just evaluate a European option. Then I first define the function that maps the strike to the value of the European option divided by the normal rare. And for this, I just call here the value of the European option. And I just ask the model, model, please give me the numa rare, yeah, and I will divide by the numa rare. Um, actually, a small remark, there's a funny thing here in this lemma. It is not necessary that the numa rare used inside here by the model has this property. Yeah? Uh, because here you could use a change of numa rare in the measure, which will give you the same valuation. Yeah? Um, however, it is relevant here that this is the density associated with the measure that is associated with this numa rare that is one at payment time. Yeah? So it's not necessary that the model that we feed in here has this property, but the density that we will pull out is the density that corresponds to the measure where the numa rare is equal to one at payment time. Okay, so first step is that we feed here in a model, and I just define the function evaluate a call option for a given strike. So strike is the argument of my double unary operator, and I just create a European option with that strike. And on that European option here, I can call the method get value with my given model. Yeah? The model that I have created here from the model specification that came in here. I divide by the numa rare and take the expectation. So this is the function that calculates the value divided by the numa rare. Now comes the function that calculates the density. So for a given strike, I calculate the value. So this is the function that here is on top with strike plus shift, the upshifted value. Oops. Minus two times the unshifted value plus the downshifted value divided by h squared. So recall our section on the second order derivative, the second derivative. Yeah, this is here our finite difference approximation of the second derivative. It was upshift value minus two times unshifted value plus downshifted value divided by h squared. So this is my second derivative, and this is then my density function. So not much code yeah, that you see is going on here. Uh, it's just this here that calculates the density for any given model. And now let's do this for our Monte Carlo Black Scholes model, Monte Carlo Bachelier model, Monte Carlo Heston model. So let's run this little program. The density of the Black Scholes model, Bachelier model, Heston model. Um, so you see, this looks for the Black Scholes model really like a log normal distribution. The probability that the stock falls below zero is zero. Yeah. This looks quite nice. For the Bachelier model, it looks like a normal distribution. Yeah. So the stock can become negative under this model. And for the Heston model, we have a stochastic volatility. Uh, so you see that it trans it's, it's like a log normal model, but the distribution is um, a little bit transformed. Uh, the Heston model here increases the volatility if the stock has a higher value because the two prominent drivers have a positive correlation. And where volatility is high, the stock doesn't like to be. 
Yeah? So it actually pushes the stock away from this region. Yeah? Where volatility is low, the stock stays for a long time yeah? because it doesn't move so fast. Yeah? Um, so this means that the probability goes a little bit down here yeah? uh, in, in this region yeah? and it becomes a little bit higher here. Yeah? So I go up to uh, 0.8 in, in, in this region. Yeah? So it uh, pushes a little bit the uh, or transforms a little bit the distribution. So we can infer the probability density of the model. Also interesting, my models are Monte Carlo models. So for example, what happens if you calculate here the values with few Monte Carlo sample paths? Yeah? So we will get a very high Monte Carlo error. What does this to the probability density? So let's run the program again. So this is the density of the Heston model. This is the density of the Bachelier model. And this is the density of the Black Scholes model. So you see that the Monte Carlo error induces errors in the densities, but still the density yeah, resembles to the higher quality versions here. Yeah? So you still see the log normal or normal nature. So to some sense, uh, the Monte Carlo implementation doesn't create a wrong model, it just creates a model with a different uh, density. I have a third example here, and this example is now a little bit different, um, because I'm now calculating analytically prices using the implied Black Scholes uh, volatility. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm creating here just um, a volatility curve that maps uh, Black Scholes volatility to every strike. And then I just pass this to the Black Scholes formula. Yeah? So I have the Black Scholes formula, but I will use a different sigma for every value of the stock. Yeah? So this is usually what you observe on the market. You see European call option prices, and then you see these prices quoted in terms of implied Black Scholes uh, volatility. And we can now just infer the probability density from observing the option prices on the market. Of course, we do not observe a continuum of prices, so we cannot observe a continuum for the density. But since I do finite difference, a finite difference just needs three different prices, yeah? an upshift value price, a downshift value price, a price in the middle. And from these three prices, you can approximate the probability density at that region. Yeah? So just by observing prices on the market, you can infer the probability density that is associated with these prices on the market. So in this example, I just generate here uh, a little bit artificially uh, prices. I have two uh, parameters here, an amplitude yeah, and uh, a width for this um, implied uh, volatility curve. And um, let's look how that looks. Yeah? So for example, if the Black Scholes implied volatility is, yeah, say almost uh, 50%, yeah, um, a little bit higher here and then a little bit lower there, then this looks like a log normal distributed um, density. It looks like a Black Scholes model, but you see, the implied volatility goes down if the stock value, so if the strike goes up. Yeah? So I mentioned that where volatility is high, the stock doesn't like to be because it's pushed away. Yeah? Where volatility is lower, the stock likes to be, it stays longer there. And you see that this decline here corresponds to a slight increase in the density at, at uh, that point here. Uh, but this is uh, really a possible density. Yeah? So it could be that you observe these option prices here. It's a possible density also because uh, the density does not fall below zero. Uh, you can create, however, an example where, let's take here a higher amplitude in this 
implied volatility surface. So if I take a higher amplitude in this implied volatility surface, this curve will be a little bit stronger, yeah, higher and have here a larger decline. So compared to my previous example. And now you see that in the probability density, uh, something is happening. If you zoom in here a little bit, you see that the probability density is below zero. I have a negative probability density, which means that actually these prices here cannot happen on the market. Actually, they can happen on the market, but they cannot happen in an arbitrage-free model. And this is my concluding remark. If a model exhibits, exhibits regions with negative probability densities, then the model is not arbitrage-free. So let's illustrate what's happening here. A call option has this payoff here. So the valuation of this payoff looks a little bit like that. Okay, so under the Black Scholes model, yeah, the Black Scholes formula would give me like uh, something like this. So if you now create a second derivative, what are you doing? You are taking upshift value minus two times unshifted value plus downshifted value divided by two h. So upshifted value divided by downshifted value is actually the average that you would expect here uh, minus Two times the unshifted value divided by two is actually this value here. So this is a portfolio. Your finite difference is a portfolio. So let's amplify the situation a little bit. Finite difference, upshift value plus downshift value divided by two is this average here minus the unshifted value is this value. So the finite difference tells you this amount here. Upshift value, downshift value, unshifted value. If the second derivative is positive, this amount is positive, it means that you have to pay for this portfolio. Now, if the probability density is negative, this amount is negative, so the price curve is no longer convex, it's concave, and suddenly you get this portfolio for free. So this probability density actually corresponds to a price of a portfolio. So maybe we can illustrate here the payoff of this portfolio, uh, upshifted value minus two times unshifted values plus downshifted value. So if this is the value of the underlying, this is the strike X, this is the strike X plus H, then upshifted value minus one times the unshifted value This has a payoff of zero if you are below strike x, then minus v of x goes like that, but then plus v of x plus h is compensating this. <clears throat> so that is this payoff. But now I have additionally downshifted value v of x minus h minus the unshifted value v of x. So these two products, so this portfolio has the payoff zero if I'm below x minus h, 
then linear with the stock and then minus v of x so that is neutralizing the payoff of the stock like that so such that the sum of the two has the payoff zero below x minus h then linear up and linear down so this is the this little triangle is the payoff of this portfolio. So our finite difference is a portfolio that has a positive payoff, this triangle. So it pays whenever the stock is between x minus h and x plus h. But the value of this portfolio can be interpreted as the finite difference that is, apart from the scaling factor, equal to the density. And if the density is negative, it means that this payoff has a negative price on the market, or the model is predicting a negative price for this portfolio. Uh, 